Hello to this first talk uh, to Chaos West today on the third day of RC3. Um, I'm happy to welcome uh, Robert, also known as ad.de. Um, he's a string theorist from Munich. Um, it's his fourth talk uh, at C3. Um, he's going to talk about infinities um, in hopefully somewhat an accessible way uh, for non-physicists as well. Um, and um, yeah, the talk is going to be pre-recorded. It's going to last about 45 minutes. And um, you're ha we're, we're happy for you to ask questions uh, as usual on IRC. At, uh, the channel is hash RC3 minus CWTV um, or on Twitter or Mastodon, same hashtag. Um, yes, so if you have any questions, ask them there. And I think we can start the talk. Hello, welcome to this presentation about the really big. I want to take you to infinity today and uh, look at various aspects and I will show you that there are different infinities um, and I hope there is something for everybody independent of what is your previous knowledge of mathematics or physics or even philosophy. So infinity, confronting the really big. What, what are we going to talk about? The plan today is we're going to meet a couple of people the first will be the ancient Greeks, uh, because they already thought about infinity. Um, then I will tell you what mathematicians know about how to deal with infinity. Um, we will see how games come into, um, into the story. Uh, and then there will be a final chapter where I discuss physics and infinity, which is my home turf. I teach at a university in Munich, uh, theoretical physics. So uh, I guess everybody has already thought about infinity and this is a really big number. Well, is it a number? Well, I think everybody has contemplated that. Um, but the problem with this number is that it's hard to compute with the number because if you add one to infinity, it seems it's still infinite. So you, you have an equation that says infinity is the same as one plus infinity, and then you can cancel infinity on both sides. Um, then you get zero equals one, and every mathematician's head explodes. So you have to be a little bit more subtle than this. And today I want to show you how to be subtle about infinity. So as I said, already the Greeks considered infinity. A famous one is Aristotle in his book Physics, he discussed an old riddle, and that is that of Achilles. Achilles was uh, supposed to be probably the fastest runner in ancient Greek, and he was running a race with a turtle. Obviously, um, Achilles runs much faster than a turtle. Let's say he runs 10 times as fast as the turtle. So they give the turtle a head start. Let's say they give the turtle a 10 meter head start, and then the race starts. Uh, and of course, Achilles runs really fast, but the question is, can he overtake the turtle? And of course, he runs the first 10 meters very quickly, but in the time that he runs 10 meters, the turtle has run itself for a meter, so he hasn't caught up. So he runs the other meter, the turtle runs another 10 centimeters. Still, Aristotle, uh, sorry, still uh, Achilles has not overtaken the turtle. And it goes on and on and on. And Aristotle ask the question, does he actually ever overtake the turtle? How can this be? There's an infinite number of steps. So you add something in every step. Every time you think Aristotle, uh, you think um, Achilles catches up with the turtle, it has gone further. And uh, he wondered, does he ever overtake the turtle? Of course, everybody knows from real life that Achilles will overtake the turtle, but it seems like you're adding an infinite number of terms. So this could be an infinite number. So we encountered our first um, problem with the naive treatment of infinity. Another question that Aristotle con uh, considered was the question of the continuum. Say you have a bar of chocolate and you subdivide the bar of chocolate into two parts. And then you further subdivide the two parts and subdivide uh, the parts and you keep going. Um, 
you could imagine doing this infinitely often, and then you end up with an infinite number of very, very tiny pieces of chocolate. And the question is, how can this be? Is it still, when you've done it infinitely often, is it still chocolate? And you end up with infinitely many parts. So either each part contains zero chocolate, then you have zero times, well, infinity, that seems like you don't have chocolate anymore. Or each tiny bit still has a finite size, um, and then you have uh, infinity times a finite size, which seems like you have turned your chocolate into an infinite amount of chocolate. And that's absurd as well. And Aristotle wrote pages and pages about this question, um, how to resolve the problem of the continuum. But of course, also, also the ancient Greeks knew the answer, at least in the case of chocolate. Um, they invented atoms. They said, at some point, when you try to further subdivide, you cannot do it without hurting the character of the chocolate. There are smallest chocolate particles, and let's call them atoms. And by this line of thought, they invented atoms without knowing anything about protons and electrons and so on. They just came up with atoms from this riddle about infinity. And they said the infinite divisibility of the chocolate is just an idealization. We will later find that this is still a pretty modern answer when it comes to physics. Mathematicians weren't really happy because they said, well, it's an ad hoc solution. Maybe we can come up with something better. But it turns out uh, it took them several centuries to resolve this in a mathematically satisfactory way. And of course, this is the foundation of calculus, which was invented uh, essentially by Newton and Leibniz independently or uh, concurrently. So um, what is the solution mathematicians have to, to this question? And here I show you how uh, mathematicians Bolzano and Weierstrass formalized this. And probably you've seen this if you have seen any uh, university mathematics. Uh, you say a sequence, like here I take the sequence of Aristotle's steps of 10, 11, 11.1, 11.11, .1, uh, converges to a limit, and you write the limit of the se sequence a n, when n goes to infinity is a, if you can have a dialogue like the following. Um, so person a, let's call him green, claims the limit is 100 over 9, and there's a second person, let's say yellow says, I don't believe you, and then says green says, Actually, what's the accuracy that you want uh, to know the answer to? Say, it's called epsilon. What is the accuracy that you're happy with? Then yellow can say any number, say one over a million. And then green says, okay, and I can prove you that from the seventh part in my sequence, all further elements of the sequence are closer to 100 over 9 than the epsilon you chose. Of course, the 7 is a reaction to the 1 over a million, but the, if you can show that you have such an answer for every possible choice of yellow's liking for, for this very small a number, uh, then you have shown that the sequence converges. Or as mathematicians would write this, so for every epsilon, uh, there is a number n, a natural number n, such that for all larger natural numbers, uh, the sequence is closer to the supposed limit than your limit epsilon. And the nice thing um, about uh, phrasing the question of convergence and of limits of inf infinite sequences like this is that you never ever have to really hit uh, the limit point. The sequence, the true value of the sequence is not a member of the sequence. And you can even replace the limit with infinity and then uh, instead of a small epsilon for the accuracy, you say, okay, I want that the sequence is bigger than 42 millions. And then you say, okay, from sequence point so-and-so, you're always bigger. So if for every bound, you can, uh, no matter how large it is, you can say, okay, from a certain point on the sequence is bigger than that bound, you say it converges to infinity. Okay, so this is one notion of infinity. And another one uh, comes from a very simple process that where you probably also first thought about of infinity, and that's of counting things. So let's count sheep. One, two. And the question is, what is counting? How, how do we do this? Can we formalize this? 
uh, in a way that infinity is a valid answer. So let's say we have three sheep, one, two, and three, um, then counting them means we come up with a one-to-one -one correspondence between each sheep and one of the three numbers. And then we've said we've counted the sheep. So we've counted them, they are three. Or you could say, maybe I don't want to count them with numbers. I want to make sure that two sets have the same size so I can replace the numbers by fruits and then say, I have as many sheep as I have fruits if there is a one-to-one -one mapping between fruits and sheep. And that concept goes under the name of cardinality. And you just say, by definition, two sets have the same number of elements or the same cardinality if the elements can be matched in a one-to-one -one way, like we've done with the sheep and the fruits. So, for example, the set foo, bar, and bads has the same number of elements as the set one, two, three. So you would say there are three elements in the set, but it has a different number of elements than the set that just contains our favorite numbers 23 and 42. So if you remove the strawberry, there are fewer fruits than sheep. This sounds terribly trivial, but the nice thing is uh, you can extend this requirement of having a one-to-one -one mapping to an infinite number of elements or infinite sets. And the mathematician who first formalized this is, was Georg Cantor. Let's see how this works for infinity. So for example, take the natural numbers, one, two, three, and so on, and call their cardinality Aleph zero or Aleph naught. Aleph is, is a Hebrew letter, and he thought uh, that it's a good idea to come up uh, since we are talking about really big things, to access a new alphabet, in this case, Hebrew numbers. So, Aleph naught is the cardinality of the natural numbers. And the maybe surprising thing about natural numbers is that you can have a proper subset having the same cardinality. So, say, for example, from the natural numbers, you remove the one. You only have the set of two, three, four, and so on. Then the set has the same size because... You can map 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and so on. And that is the idea of Hilbert's hotel. It's an infinite hotel that's fully booked. But then another nerd arrives, and Hilbert says, oh, that's easy, everybody move up one room. And then the nerd can go into the first room and sleep for the night. Similarly, even the even numbers have the same cardinality. So 2, 4, 6, and so on, because you can map them in a one-to-one -one way. Oh, there's a typo in my slides. So I map 1 to 2. I should map 2 to 4, not to 3. 3 to 6, and so on. You see there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the natural numbers and the even numbers. And therefore, they are the same numbers of even numbers as natural numbers, even though, in some sense, you would probably say that only half as many even numbers but not in this formalization as cardinality. And because so many sets have the cardinality of the natural numbers, there's a name for those that those are count, called countable. And you can also see that a set is finite exactly if it does not have the same cardinality than any of its subset. When we removed the strawberry, there were fewer fruit than sheep. But when we removed the one from the natural numbers, uh, it had the same cardinality, and that showed that the natural numbers have an infinite cardinality. And even other sets that look bigger have the same cardinality. For example, the set of pairs, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and so on, then 2, 1, 2, 2, and so on, has the same cardinality as the natural numbers, because um, you can lay a path through this table that looks like this, that goes diagonally, and if you number each pair by the step in the path in which it is reached, you see that there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Every pair is reached exactly once. And so there are as many pairs as there are natural numbers. And from pairs, by just writing the pairs as fractions, so instead of writing one comma two, you write one half, you can see that there are as many rational numbers, so or fractions, as natural numbers, so the rational numbers are still countable. And you can easily generalize this. Once you have the tuples, uh, you have uh, the pairs, you can generalize this to any tuples. So uh, also, the hundred tuples are still countable. 
And from that follows, for example, the fact that the set of all computer programs of finite length, because they are finite strength, you can enumerate them, because there's a finite alphabet, and they are still countable. So if you're into constructive mathematics, where things only exist if you can give a recipe how to construct them, then your universe of constructible things is also countable, because the recipes are a countable set. They are made up of finite strings. Okay, now you might have the idea, okay, infinity is the number of elements of the natural numbers. So it seems like every finite set, every infinite set I've shown you so far, I have the cardinality of the natural numbers. But now I want to show you also, this is an argument due to Cantor, that the real numbers are actually more than the natural numbers. You cannot map them in a one-to-one -one way to the natural numbers. So how does this work? So assume you've come up uh, with a sequence of all real numbers, so you can write them one above the other. So maybe it starts with the first number 0 0.31415926.5 and so on. So I've, uh, for the sake of argument, I've written all these numbers such that they are between 0 and 1. So once you've enumerated those all real numbers between 0 and 1, then you can extend this trivially. To all the real numbers. Say the next number is 0 0.42, the next number is 0 0.23232323, the next number is 0 0.12345678, and so on and so on. And this list goes on. So it doesn't stop after six elements, it goes on forever. And eventually, uh, every real number is in this list. So let's make this assumption. Then I claim, or actually Kanta claims, we've missed at least one number, one real number. We can construct a real number that is not in the list, and it goes like the following. So the claim is the number 0 0.43352542 uh, and so on is still missing. So how did I come up with this number? And I didn't give you the list of all, all the real numbers, only of the first six, so how can I know it's missing? Well, this is how I construct it. In the first place after the decimal point, I look at the first number, there's a three, so my number that is missing, I put there a 4. At the second place, I look at the second number, there was a 2, I replace it, I, I, so I write down a 3. Then for another 2, I write down another 3, for another for 4, I write down a 5, for 3, I write down a 4, and so on. So by doing this, I make sure that the number that I'm writing down on the bottom differs in at least one decimal place from all the numbers in the list. Uh, and therefore, this number it cannot, is unequal to any number in the list. And therefore, the cardinality, let's denote this with Aleph 1, actually, that's an assumption, but we know the, the cardinality of the real numbers is bigger, because if we try to match it in a one-to-one -one way, we are missing numbers. I should mention that, of course, it's not true uh, in constructive mathematics, because, um, as I said, constructions... Uh, are countable. So the constructive people miss a lot of the real numbers. And there's also a famous hypothesis called the continuum hypothesis, which says that actually uh, the two infinities of the natural numbers and the real numbers are next to each other. There cannot be a set which is bigger than the natural numbers, but smaller than the real numbers. And it's a hypothesis and not a theorem, because it can be proven that it cannot be proven or disproven. You can add either the statement or uh, the negative of the statement to your uh, standard set theory and don't produce uh, a contradiction. So it's an so the continuum hypothesis is in fact an independent axiom. And if you know a little bit more about mathematics, you can see that what we've proven here with this argument is actually that the cardinality of the power set of a set, so the power set is the set of all subsets of the set, is bigger than the cardinality of the set. And the nice thing about these cardinalities is that you can compute with them, you can calculate with them. For example, you can take the sum of two cardinals, which is just the cardinality of the disjoint union of the two sets. Or you can multiply them uh, by taking the cardinality of all pairs of one element from one set and one element from the other set. And you can even take powers. 
So cardinality of, n of set m to the power of the cardinality of n is simply the cardinality of the set of all functions from n to m. And you can see that uh, in this way, you can see the, um, the power set of m to be 2 to the m, because for each subset, you can, uh, you can have 0 mapped to the elements of the set that are in the subset, and 1 to the ones that are not in the subset. But uh, you cannot go backwards with cardinal numbers. You cannot subtract or divide in general. So this was uh, the concept of infinity. And we've seen already two types of infinities. So we've seen aleph naught, aleph one, uh, when we extend the process of counting uh, to infinite sets. Um, so we've generalized one, two, three, and so on to infinite sets. There's an alternative approach, uh, which gives you the ordinal numbers, um, where rather than you generalize counting, you generalize uh, positions in a sorted list. So first, second, third, and so on. And this leads to the ordinal numbers. So well, what, what, uh, how does it work? So for this, we need our sets to be what's called well-ordered. It means there is a relation between two elements um, which has to obey three rules. Rule one is that two elements are either less than, or uh, one is less than the other, or the other way around, or they're equal. Um, also, it's transitive. So if x is less than y, and y is less than z, then x should also be less than z. And also, re you require that each non-empty subset of M has a least element, so a smallest element, one element, such that no element no other element of that subset is small. So, and you, for example, the natural numbers with the usual ordering have this property. Um, and from the last property, it follows, for example, that there is no infinite decreasing sequence. Um, and then you say that two ordered sets have the same ordinality type if there is one-to-one -one mapping that preserves this ordering. So let's see what kind of order numbers do we have? So every, uh, uh, for, well, to do this, you can see that actually, if you have the set of all ordinals up to some point, the set of all ordinals up to that point can be viewed as the next ordinal. So the set of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 41, uh, can be viewed as the number 42. And if you add that to the set, then this set represents 43 and so on. So let's see, let's get started. So one, two, three, four, are of course, ordinal numbers. And if you, if you set are the natural numbers, uh, this ordinal number is in, uh, is usually called omega. But then you can form the set that contains all natural numbers and omega, and that gives you omega plus one. And once you have omega plus one, you can also have omega plus two, omega plus three, and so on. And then you throw in all these natural numbers. So omega plus any natural number, you make a set of all that ordinals. And that ordinal is usually denoted omega times two. And then you can still add one and two and so on. It gives you ordin and so on. It gives you omega times three, omega times four and so on. And of course you can re keep repeating this. Uh, and once you've put in all the ordinal numbers of that type, you get a new ordinal, which is omega squared. And you can add one and so on and so on and then come to omega cubed and so on. And you keep continuing that and you get even bigger infinities. You get omega to the omega and you keep repeating that. You get omega to the omega to the omega and so on and so on and so on. Then you come to a number that's called epsilon naught, which is kind of the limit of omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the omega, to the omega where you this is the set where you put in all the numbers that you can reach in this way. And this is the smallest, we will see this. So uh, this is the smallest ordinal number such um, that, uh, so this, let's call it alpha, such that omega to the alpha is alpha, right? So we've generated ordinals and we, you've seen that every ordinal has a successor, right? So if an ordinal represents a set, then you simply add that ordinal to the set and you get, uh, you get the successor. Um, and 
the set of all ordinal up to including that ordinal. But not every ordinal is a successor of something. So, for example, omega, the ordinal, uh, ordinal type of the natural numbers, there is no uh, predecessor such that when you add on one, you get omega. So those ordinals which are not successors are called limits. Uh, so, for example, omega times gamma is the gamma limit. Uh, the way we've de de defined it on the previous slide. And omega to the gamma is the gamma ordinal that is not the sum of two ordinals, right? So, for example, omega plus 42 was a sum of two ordinals. And uh, so omega plus a natural number is always a sum of two ordinals. And the first ordinal that is not of this type is omega squared. So it's the second ordinal that is not the sum of two ordinals. And in the same way, epsilon subscript gamma is the gamma ordinal, as I said, for which omega to the alpha is alpha. Okay, and we can add ordinals. Uh, from two well-ordered sets, say M and N, you can form the disjoint union and you can order that union uh, by first ordering, by simply putting them next to each other. So considering every element of M as smaller than any element of N. And this define this makes the disjoint union a, a totally ordered set, and uh, the ordinality type of this set is m plus n. Uh, note, however, that omega plus omega is not omega, right? Because the first set, omega plus omega, has two limit points. So omega plus omega would be you put two copies of the natural numbers next to each other, where all the elements of the second set are considered bigger than the ones of the first set. Then um, the first natural numbers have a limit point, and then come the next second copy, and they also have a limit point. Uh, so there are two limit points, whereas omega, as just the ordina ordinal type of the natural numbers, only has a single limit point. So these two ordinals are different. Uh, similarly, 3 plus omega, which is the set 1, 2, 3, and then you put all the natural numbers. So, I mean, the 1 is a different 1, right? Uh, the 1, 2, 3 doesn't have a limit point, so this set omega, uh, 3 plus omega has only one limit point. Uh, uh, sorry, om 3 plus omega has no limit element because it it's either 1, 2, 3 or another natural number, so there are no limit points, whereas the second one, omega plus 3, has first all the natural numbers, then comes omega, then comes omega plus 1, plus 2, plus, plus 3. So these sets are different. So you see that addition of ordinals defined as I've done it is not commutative. The order matters. But it's still associative. Um, and you can show that if the ordina ordinal type of M plus the ordinal type of N is the same as M plus K, then this implies that N equals K. So you can cancel the M on the left, but it doesn't work on the right. And there's also a notion of multiplication where you do the ordering by taking, well, again, you take pairs um, uh, and, you do, and you do lexicographic order, uh, but uh, let's not go into this. Rather, consider games. So, uh, and this connection uh, was discovered by John Horton Conway, um, who unfortunately died in 2020 following an infection with COVID. And you probably know John Horton Conway if, uh, because he is an inventor of many things, among those, the game of life. But he was a famous mathematician who invented many, many things, and in particular, he found the connection between numbers and games. So how does it work? So we consider deterministic two-player games of finite duration. So these are games without um, without um, randomness, so no dice, no card drawings. Um, and deterministic also means that every player knows all the possible future moves at any point. So there is no secret component like having cards in your hand, but we're thinking of games like Go or chess, for example. Um, and we're going to set up our games with the convention that a player who cannot move anymore has lost and the other player has won. And 
uh, usually these players have names, they're called left and right, or L and R. And then a game, or which is a synonym with situation, uh, is simply given by all the situations, or games, that L or R can move to. So a game X is a pair of a set of games, X left and X right, and X left are all the, the situations that left can move to, and XR are all the situations that right can move to. So that's the definition of a game. It seems like uh, I've defined a game in terms of set of games, so it seems circular, but I haven't. That is the trick. Uh, because there is already a simplest game. The simplest game is the one where no player can make any move, where the sets are empty. Of course, an empty set is a set of games. And let's call this game zero, where there are no moves at all. Now we have one game, and we can say, for example, there's a game in which player L can move to the game zero, and player right has no option. So that's the first game here, I call that one, or the game where player right can move to the game that has no further moves, and let's call that minus one. And once I have these games, I can also form the game, for example, where player left can move to the game one, and player right has no choice, or I can form the game uh, where each player can move to the to the game with no further options, and that op that game is called star. So, um, turns out not all games are numbers, but we have to look at who's winning. So, and winning means we always assume that players try to play with the optimal strategy. So, there are two situations: either L starts or R starts. So, if if L starts. Um, and L can force a win, then we call this game fuzzy to zero. And this is exactly those games, um, or we call it fuzzy to zero or greater than zero, depending on what happens when R starts. So if R starts and R wins, it's fuzzy to zero. So fuzzy to zero means the player who starts wins the game. Whereas uh, if L always wins, it's called greater than zero. So no matter who starts, and uh, if if uh, right wins when L starts and also wins when right starts, so right always wins, the game is called less than zero, and the game is called equal to zero if always the second player wins. Maybe we can illustrate this with a very simple game called Hattenbush. Um, that's a very simple illustrative game. So a game here consists of these trees that are connected to the grounds and they come in green and red shape. And each player, when it's their turn, can cut uh, legs of, of their favorite colors. So for example, so green is the color of left and red is the color of right. So for example, green can cut this thing, oh sorry, uh, above here, and then everything that is no longer connected to the ground um, disappears from the game. So now left moved, uh, removed this bit of green, then right can move, removes this thing, then green moves, removes this last bit here, then right moves by removing here uh, another bit, and then left um, removes this, and now red cannot move anymore because there are no red pieces left, and therefore green has won. So remember, uh, left started, so... Uh, and this puts it uh, in... Um, in one of the four categories. So our games that we've encountered so far also appear here. So the game that just contains of one green bit is the game where green can remove this bit and turn it into the game where there are no further moves and right cannot do anything. Similarly, this thing here, this game, uh, left can remove this and turn it into the game one. Um, and right cannot do anything, so this game is the game two. Uh, and you realize that you can also move this bit here, because now left can remove this and turn it into one. This would re turn it immediately to zero. That would be not a good move for left. So left would always cut here. So this is, in fact, the same game two. Also, for an obvious reason, by exchanging the colors, um, this gives you the game minus one. And then we can also make this game. So the question, so uh, left can turn it into zero 
and right by removing this it turns it into the game one so the question is what is this game so i've put a question mark here so let's figure this out um so to do this i have to show you how to compute with games and simply um we define the addition of two games x plus y by saying we put the two games next to each other and then when it's their turn each player can decide in which game to make a move and then do the move in that game and present this pair of remaining games to the other players so x plus y is the game so where x is x left and x right and y is y left and y right is the game where x where left can move either in the in the x game leaving the one of the xl options and leave the y game intact or leave the x game intact and make one of his moves in the in the left in the y game and similarly on the on the right hand side and this addition is actually inspired by go rules where you have independent situations in different parts of the board and you can decide in which of the two independent situations you move and you can also negate a game by simply flipping the two sides so minus x the game minus x is where uh left can move to kind of all the flipped games that right could move before and similarly on on the other side so now still the question what is the value of this game here and i will show you so the following thing so here is again the table uh so let's add another copy to this game and i also want to add a version of minus one remember this game was minus one so let's investigate uh, where we are so let's first see what happens when left moves so left so le left starts and so it will cut one of these things doesn't matter so uh remove this then right it's right's turn uh so the cutting this bit is is better because if he doesn't do it uh his option will be removed by left's move so he cuts there then left moves here then right moves here and left cannot move so right wins so we are here l starts right wins so we are in this part of the table so let's set it up again and see what happens if right starts so right uh, as i explained it's always better to cut one of the upper options so cut here uh, right starts removes this now it's left's move for left it's better to cut here because it il eliminates this option for right so so and now red moves and green moves and now it's red's turn again uh, and there's nothing left to move so uh left wins and therefore we're in this corner of the table so, so this game is zero so we found that this combination the game that we're looking for plus itself plus minus one gives zero and therefore it makes sense to assign this game the value of one half because twice itself minus one is zero so and this way of setting up games gives us what I call the serial numbers. And you see immediately that all ordinals are also serial numbers. So remember, ordinals were the ones we could have omega to, to the omega to the omega and so on. By simply putting the ordinal in as the left moves and giving no moves to the right player, then in the same construction as we constructed ordinals, we, can, we construct games here, uh, and there are lots of them. So for example, the move uh the game omega is the one where left has the choice to move to any of the natural numbers and right has no choice so in hackenbush that, that would look like uh this infinite tree note that this is not an infinite game because as soon as left moves for example by cutting here it will turn into a finite set of nodes and therefore no matter where you start the game is finite it's the length is not bounded but every game is finished after a finite number of steps steps and so so we found find the ordinals but the surreal numbers that come from the games also contains the reals so i've shown you one half in a similar way you can generate in fact uh all the rational numbers um 
and so and then putting all the rational numbers that are less than pi in left moves and putting all the rational numbers that are greater than pi in right moves gives you a game and it will turn out that the value of this game is actually pi you can multiply and divide by games i don't show you the formulas i've shown you the formulas for addition uh, multiplication also exists um, and the serial numbers contain even more numbers so for example because you can divide you can divide one by omega that's usually called epsilon and this is a game where left can move to the empty game and right can move to all the positive rational numbers and this is a number uh, that is greater than zero but smaller than any real number so this is uh, a third way that infinities can be handled by mathematicians and by handled means uh, you discover that there's not a single number infinity but there's actually a large large set of different infinite values and I showed you how to compute with them but also infinity appears in the real world say in physics in and there are different ways in which infinities appear so maybe you heard that in quantum field theory when you compute scattering between elementary particles as set up by Feynman uh, and his Feynman diagrams, you find that if you do the co computation that is encoded in this picture, um, you get infinite numbers. But it turns out this infinity uh, is not real because here you're computing uh, with things that are not observable. So how does this infinity come about? So let's say here, here's an electron that flies, um, or say a proton, a positively charged particle that flies next to another positively charged particle. Then there are quantum fluctuations, denoted here by these little things, where pairs of particles and antiparticles pop up from the vacuum. And since they have opposite charges, um, they're attracted in different directions, so they shield the electric field of this uh, this particle here. So when this particle flies by, it doesn't see the charge only of this particle, but it sees the charge of this whole thing. And this is slightly less charged uh, than this because these virtual pairs sh uh, shield the charge of the uh, of the core. And therefore, this electron here, or this proton here, perceives a smaller charge than is actually there. Um, and when you set up your calculation, um, instead of, in, in, in terms of this, the charge of the particle in the center, then you find that it, that will be infinite. But since this charge alone is never observable, because this charge is always surrounded by this cloud of virtual particles and antiparticles, uh, this thing, the charge of this thing doesn't really exist. And if you set up your calculation in terms of the stuff that you can actually observe, say the charge of this whole cloud here, then you find that you never encounter infinity. So, um, well, this is a prose way of saying there's a way to compute this Feynman diagram such that you never encounter infinities. Because in the end, in the physically observable things like the scattering amplitude or the decay rates, um, you never see infinite numbers. Then you've seen singularities in general relativity, like the singularity inside a black hole. Uh, this year's Nobel Prize goes to uh, three physicists. One of them is Roger Penrose. He investigated uh, the nature of, of these singularities. So you, here you see him next to a black hole, or actually an artist's impression of a black hole. So here, the infinity uh, is... The, so our understanding of this infinity inside a black hole is that actually the theory of general relativity is not good enough, very close to this very dense mass, close to the singularity. You have to come up with a theory of quantum gravity, like string theory, or some other quantum gravity, and then this actual knowledge of the fundamental theory will replace the infinity. And the fact that you've computed infinity just shows you that your theory is not good enough. You have to come up with a more general theory, like superstrings. This is a bit like the Greek example with the chocolate bar, 
where you say, actually, when you make your chocolate pieces small enough, uh, they, and the, the idea that everything is chocolate is no longer true. You, you hit the atoms. So here you would hit the strings. And there's even a third way of encountering infinity. So for example, you can have infinitely big uh, systems. And you can, for example, show that there's a f th that things like phase transitions here between liquid water and ice only exist in infinite systems. So if you have a finite system, so this ice block will weigh many, many tons, but it's finite, then strictly speaking, or mathematically speaking, there is no phase transition. There's a continuous transition between liquid water and, and, and a big ice block. But um, pretending that the system is actually infinite and that there are two phases like ice and liquid water is actually a good approximation. So taking a large system, pretending a large system is actually infinite is an approximation that simplifies your life and shows you that some effects better than the actual thing. So um, it can infinity can be a good approximation is um, uh, the upshot of this slide. And so it's one of the idealizations that physicists like to do in order to be able to describe things. So here you see the approximation of a spherical cow that you have um, probably seen in the cartoon before. Um, so you can say it's always stupid, like the spherical cow, and the real thing is not the approximation. But I would argue um, that you could, in exactly the same manner, argue that real numbers are not relevant for physics because they're an idealization, because you can never measure a real number. Every measurement has a finite accuracy. And within the arrow bounds, there's always a rational number. So you can never be sure that something, some measurement comes out as a real number. You could never distinguish it from a rational number. So you could say real numbers are a great idea of mathematicians, but they're an idealization that have no um, expression in the real world like spherical cows or infinite icebergs. But of course, you know, every day we compute as if measurements were real numbers. So uh, I would argue it's as good to argue that infinite systems should be considered as measurements like where you measure something where the value is pi. Okay, so that was my brief run through various notions of infinity. I am will be here, because I'm pre-recording this, uh, for your questions. And if you come up with questions later, feel free to contact me. My email address is here uh, and also my Twitter handle. We've seen that infinities can be tamed and we've seen that there are vastly different amounts of infinity. Um, and I hope I convinced you that infinity is in fact everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, great talk. It reminded me uh, of my first year in university. Uh, well, just in a in a in a less tedious way, I think the way I probably would have wanted it to to be back then. Um, we do have a number of questions. Um, I'll just uh, put them to you. You can, if you have any questions, and they don't. I mean, maybe the talk was uh, quite technical in some areas. If you have to have something a bit more general that's related to the area, I think that that's good. We don't have too many questions at this time, so just feel free to uh, put them in, in IRC. So the first question is, um, is infinity or can infinity be a good ap approximation or is the statement infinity can be a good approximation of big things related to the law of large numbers? Yes, of course. Also, the law of large numbers kind of tells you that uh, the bigger the numbers are, the simpler things get, right? So law, of, for those who don't know what this is, law of large numbers tells you that is essentially, in a nutshell, if you have a probability distribution or you, and you have many of those and you add them together, no matter what you do, uh, you end up with a Gaussian. In, in the limit of adding infinitely many um, random variables. So yes, that, that is an example. So uh, if... I add 1,000 of those, they look pretty much like a Gaussian, 
but in, in detail, it will differ in general. So if you want to understand the difference between the Gaussian and the real thing, that can be complicated. But as soon as you go to the infinite limit, then it's just a Gaussian. Well, fine print applies, but um, in general, uh, if, if it makes sense to sum them up, then they will end up as, as a Gaussian in, in very general circumstances. So yes, uh, the infinite limit is simpler than just a thousand or a million. Great. Uh, so someone just commented uh, when, when I said it's less tedious, uh, that it's it's always less tedious if you don't have to pass an exam about it. There's probably some truth in that. Um, we had some questions about uh, the, maybe we can go back to the slides. Is that possible? Uh, okay, probably not. let's okay. try. Let's... Well, I'll ask the question anyway. Uh... Um, so we had a few questions about the game um, and uh, the question is, well, can't there be multiple distinct situations where no moves are possible? Like you can have a lot of different checkmate positions in chess. N number, say, two of, of you know, or zero of, of you can't move anywhere anymore legally. How, how, you know, why do we have so many? And in, in one way, if you look at the game, you can see that there are a lot of different ways in which you can have no moves. And then on the other hand, you say, well, I just represent that by, uh, you know, this number zero. Um, it's, I, it's, yeah. Can you, yeah. Can, can you see my screen? Yeah. Um, Do you, I, I started the presentation again. Yes. Do I, I, um, I'm, I don't know what's live right now. Let's it's live. Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, so here I've, I've, so it's of course an abstraction, right? So when, when I talk about games as numbers, then, uh, I don't care whether you play on a chessboard with wooden pieces or you draw trees on, on a piece of paper. Um, of course the games look very different, right? But the essence of the game is just what are the possible moves? And therefore, if there are no moves, there are no moves. I mean, all the games with no moves are the same games. You can come, of course, from different ways and you can realize this uh, as a chessboard or as this Hackenbush game that I showed you. But from an abstract point of view, that doesn't make a difference. However, it's important to always have to, so for this whole machinery of identifying games with with numbers, it's always important that you list both the moves of the left and of the right player. So that's not exactly what you usually do in chess, because in chess, it's either white that moves or black that moves. So you never put two chess boards next to each other, and then you decide in which board you move. So um, when you say the left player, the player whose move it is usually, right, I mean, say it's left, he cannot move, then the games can be different uh, in terms of if it were right moves, what could right do? So in that sense, you can have different games where left cannot move, and I've shown you those. So for example, all the ordinals arise as games where right has no moves at all and left moves to a natural number or to, to an ordinal number, actually. So um, so you have, to, you have to consider the game, you have to consider both options for both players. Um, but as soon as structurally the move the, the possibilities are the same, then you should consider the games as equivalent, uh, even though they can look very different. So I, I I've shown you this Hackenbush game. That's good to uh, formalize very very simple games with a, with a few moves and also to formalize many of the numbers. But of course you can have very different looking games where the options are the same. So uh, from an abstract point of view, the game I've shown you here is the game number two, and you can realize two in many different um, games like Hackenbush or Tic-Tac-Toe or whatever. Yeah, so okay. I think there are these abstraction layers maybe above each other, and you, you, you're you looking at it from a different perspective, and one is the example of... Yeah. Uh, yes, cool. Um, 
And then we had another question. Maybe you remember which slide that was. And that the question is um, that the epsilon. It, it's a different. Were, I, I call two. I call two different things epsilon. Okay. So one thing I call epsilon with subscript one. Um, that was that was in the chapter of ordinal numbers, where I said. Um, this is the, so I, I explained that you can take omega to the omega. So omega is remember omega is the ordinal that measures uh, or that represents the uh, the natural numbers, and I can take omega to the omega. That I hopefully I explained this, uh, and then you can take omega to the omega to the omega, and then you can take omega to the omega to the omega to the omega, and you can keep going, and in the ordinals, there's limit to this procedure, and that is called epsilon one. And the formal description, the formal definition of epsilon one is: so, if you have this infinite sequence of taking omega to the omega to the omega to the omega, then that number doesn't change if I take omega to that number, right? Because if I add another omega on the bottom, you get the same number. So it's it's kind of a fixed point of the operation of taking omega to the alpha, uh, to, to, to that number. So you could say if, that num if I call that number alpha, then omega to the alpha is alpha, right? And you can define epsilon one as the smallest ordinal alpha such that omega to the alpha is alpha. Mm -hmm. And you can say omega, uh, sorry, you can say Epsilon two is the second ordinal that has this property, and you can actually, in the subscript, you can put any ordinal. Um, that was one epsilon, and in this whole uh, serial number uh, story with, with the games and, um, and and the numbers with the ser serial numbers, there's also a thing called epsilon without a subscript, and that is number that I get when I take one divided by omega. So omega is the ordinal, ordinal type of, of the natural numbers. And I can, and the serial numbers are almost a field and copper of Deutsch. Uh, so you can add and multiply mm -hmm. with the real numbers. The only thing that is when, it, when I say it's almost a field is that the serial numbers are actually so many that they're in the set. Um, so in, in, in usual set theory, it's too big for a set. But apart from that, so it's only a class. But uh, apart from that, it's a field and you can calculate. And in particular, you can take one divided by omega. Right? That is a number that is positive. You can show that this number is positive. But you can also show that if I take any rational or real number, any positive rational or real number, that one over omega is smaller than that number. So in some sense, mm -hmm. it's infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. It's like dx in, in when you take the derivative dy by dx or the dx in the integral dx. So it's a number like that. Um, and yes, it's very different. It's, it's kind of very, very, very tiny. Posit it's a very, very, very tiny positive number, whereas the other epsilon one was a really, really big uh, ordinal number. That, that so reminds to completely different things. That reminds me of I, I, there was a way of sort of adding some infinitesimal numbers and doing analysis with that outside. So, do, do you know what I mean? Yes. So so, so there's this non-standard analysis. Yes, that's what. And I mean. this is exactly um, you can do this with serial numbers. So yes, that is the same thing. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that, I always. Oh, yeah. Well, when I say it's the same thing, uh, what I actually mean it's it contained in the surreal numbers. It's contained in the right. Always... So, so the surreal numbers can do more than, than non-standard analysis. Can... Yeah, they is... okay. Uh, I always like how, how there are these connections that pop up all over the place if you yeah. sort of start pulling things together. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm more of an experimental physicist and, and then the, the theoretical physicists come and they say, oh, yeah, that's obvious, it's, it's, all, it's all the same. It's, coming from the same place yeah maybe maybe i should say that because this this whole numbers and games thing is kind of a niche thing so if people want to learn more about this so i, I only give you a glimpse of this mm -hmm. 
there are actually great books about this. So one, the definitive guide is, is a book by John Conway himself. It's called On Numbers and Games. Um, if you Google for a PDF, you find a PDF of that. Um, there, there's another book um, that actually coined the term surreal numbers. And that's written by Donald Knuth, the guy that wrote the tech system and um, uh, the textbook series on, on, on theoretical computer science. He has written a book on surreal numbers. And uh, right now I forgot the title, but that's an, e an even shallower um, introduction to these surreal numbers. And that's also highly recommended. Great. I think that's a, that's a great end to the talk. Uh, I always love book recommendations. Uh, so it's uh, been a pleasure to uh, listen to your talk and have you answer the questions. Yeah. Um, that's also what I see uh, people wrote. Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, and um, I hope you come back for your fifth time I at will. some point. Maybe in, in, in real life again on stage. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's so much better than doing it in the, in the Ken version. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think we've got uh, the next talk at uh, it's 1 p.m. now at 1.30 um, and it's going to be called, let me just see, uh, Alex. can someone tell me in the ear, Elektromobilität? Und warum sie so, wie sie derzeit vorgeschlagen wird, nicht funktionieren kann. Uh, I hope you tune back in uh, and thank you for listening. Bye. Yeah, thanks for coming.